Hey, Festival of Animation Berlin. I'm Jenny Lee. Um, it's so nice to be with you. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm coming to you from Portland, Oregon. Uh, it's pretty late here, actually. Um, I'm, I'm in my apartment that I've been in uh, for months and months. <laughs> um, of course, we've got um, COVID going pretty hard over here. So we're all a little bit cooped up. Um, and I've been mostly tucked away uh, and staying inside other than going to the grocery store for, you know, I think since like March. So it's been a little while. Um, I hope you guys are doing a little better than we are um, and, and able to, to go around. Um, but it's, it's definitely been an adjustment, uh, but we're getting through it and um, I'm glad that we could still do this. I'm, I'm super bummed that I can't be there, that I can't come out and um, see you guys in person, uh, get to know you, see what you're working on, all of those lovely things, but hopefully we'll get to do that sometime in the future. Um, either way, uh, I, I try to put something together for you guys. I try to think about, you know, um, how, I, how I do my job, how I think about, um, you know, designing for all these different kinds of animated projects um, and um, let you in a little bit on, um, you know, how I establish uh, an approach to that. Um, so I hope it's useful and um, let's, let's get into it. So we were putting this together and um, they, they uh, came back to me with my, what makes good design, which sounds like so daunting. It sounds like I'm gonna have some incredible answer for you. Uh, I wish that I did. Um, <laughs> it's, it's hard and it's a new problem every single time, but I'll go through, you know, kind of what came to my mind as I started to ask this question of myself and um, talk to you a little bit about that. And we'll, we'll see if we can get somewhere that, that hopefully gives you a new angle on things. So if you don't know much about me, um, I am currently the color designer on Pinocchio, which is a uh, Guillermo del Toro um, writing with Patrick McHale, who did Over the Garden Wall and um, directing is Guillermo um, with this guy, Mark Gustafson, who I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Um, but. Uh, that's happening here in Portland at a company called Shadow Machine, and that's going to be released on Netflix. Um, of course, it's with all the COVID stuff going on, it's a little crazy. And while animation has um, been one of the few industries that can kind of just like keep going along in a lot of instances, we're stop motion, so it's a little more complicated. Um, Netflix has been really great, and I'm actually, I still go in studio now that we've got a nurse and different things. So we're, we're doing great. The movie is still going. Um, I just don't know for sure when it's going to come out, but um, it's looking beautiful and I can't wait for you guys to see it. Um, for my part, I'll be done, I think, in the next uh, few weeks, actually. I'm kind of tethering off and doing some commercials and other stuff um, as I'm leaving, but this is what I can show you of the film right now. It's um, pretty locked down, so there's not much I can share with that but I did want to give you this little peek and just say like, it's here, it's happening, we're doing it. Um, also happening in town is Wendell and Wild um, with Henry Selleck, which I worked on for about 10 months as well, but I can't show you anything at all from that. Um, but that'll be another one that's gonna be coming out with Netflix over the next little bit of time and is a, a big stop motion project that we've been taking on around here, so. Um, I wish I could share more of that stuff with you guys and hopefully next time uh, I'll be able to share a little bit of that. But I wanted to backtrack just for a quick second just to give you guys a sense of how I came into all of this. And um, I was uh, introduced to animation. My first job in animation was as an intern at Leica, uh, which is also here in Portland. I, I moved here straight out of grad school. Um, and I wasn't in an art position. I was an art intern and then I was a PA, but I got to make a couple things. Uh, this is one of them. I got to do the look development and color script for the first little sequence, um, which has a little bit of a different tone. It's this little flashback sequence that's really graphic. 
Um, and it was a lot of fun. And uh, I really sort of fell in love with doing this job. Um, and it kind of solidified for me that this is, this is kind of what I wanted to do to be able to try and capture um, the content and the feeling of it and try and help communicate a story with the viewer is really exciting to me. So this was the first one that I got to do where I designed it and I was, um, so this is Trubshaw's Backyard. If you've seen the film, you might recognize this part of the movie. But um, the cool thing about this is like I said, this is the first one that I did um, largely on my own as far as establishing what was happening and, and where things were and painting the sky and everything. So we got to print the sky out and I got to walk around on the set that I had, that I had um, helped craft and um, sort of fell in love with stop motion extra. I mean, I already knew I really liked it. Um, that's why I went to like it in the first place, but it was a cool thing because so Michelle Breton set the look for the box trolls. And one of the things about it was this really specific nervous kind of line style that he would do. And you can't really see it, probably it's too small, but um, one of the things when I was making the art was um, those purple flowers that are kind of hanging over the gate are like basically just like little squiggles. It's kind of this nervous line that he would do. And I don't think I did it as successfully as he did, but um, it was, it was, very minimal and the cool thing about it is like I said the photos are a bit small but you do something like that and everybody's seeing all of that art and they know about these lines and 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 how we're trying to like show that even in the build of stuff and so you'll go out to greens and like the greens department is creating the shape of that little funnel of that wisteria that little plant um, out of wire that kind of emulates a little scribble and then rolling that through petals. And so it's like, it becomes this really cool thing where like you have a kernel of an idea and then somebody takes that and they interpret it and, and maybe make it more interesting than you, <laughs> than you really had time to or than, than you had. And it gets enhanced and elevated in these ways so that by the time it lands on stage, you've got this thing that none of us could have made on our own, but is just like, extra exciting it's the ultimate like dollhouse right um but yeah i just uh, I, I work in a lot of different kinds of animation but stop motion is just really really close to my heart um so i left like after box trolls and i went up to vancouver bc for a little bit and worked on a show called puss in boots which i'll talk a little bit about that later um but a lot of the things that I was doing after I left Puss in Boots, I was on that for their first year. So um, I came back down and I ended up freelancing. And one of the really nice things about that is that I ended up working on a lot of commercials and development on a lot of shows, that kind of thing. And um, what's nice about that is you get to move through a lot of different kinds of projects. So I got to work on VR projects. I got to work on 2D. I got to work on CG. I got to work on stop motion. I got to work on some TV pitches and film pitches. I got to work on, you know, different things. So you run through a huge gamut of different stuff and you get to work in a lot of different styles because if you're working as a freelancer and you're just on short form, you're constantly having to reinvent the wheel each time you jump onto a new project. So for me, one of the things I thought when I was putting this together is that what's unique about what I do is that I do, I work on small teams a lot. So I design a huge range of kinds of things from characters to costumes to color and light to environments, whatever it, the case may be. Um, and I also do that for a range of different kinds of mediums that all have their own problems. So, um, while I don't have one process because I work in so many different arenas that no one process kind of fits all the things, I can talk about the approach and, and the thought process enough to say like, this is where I'm coming from. This is how I'm thinking about how this is done. Um, and then applying that to each individual particular scenario. Um, so this is a little bit further on. So recently I got to production design a series of television I did a season one of The Shivering Truth, which was a stop motion animated series here, also at Shadow Machine um, with Kat Solon, who um, you'll see something later on that I did with her as well. And then the top right is Archibald's Next Big Thing, which is a 2D show that I did development art on with DreamWorks. Um, I've done a lot of shows 
with them for like pitching things and then they take them and they, and they go make the show. Um, and then some film pitches and different things. But so moving into this one, I'm gonna show you guys this video in a minute, but um, this is a spot for a company called Travel Portland, which is really neat because it's um, a company that drives tourism to Portland. So um, basically we're making an ad for this city that we live in that um, we all love so much. It's a beautiful um, artistic kind of really. So here is You Can in Portland. Whatever it is that floats your boat or tickles your taste buds or brightens your day. Even if you've never tried it before. Just know that you can in Portland. So that's the spot. And I think they have a, a few different cuts of it, but that's the, the, the basic spot. And um, so a couple of things about that. So that was done with a studio called House Special that I work with a lot. Um, and um, so Pinocchio is Guillermo del Toro working with Mark Gustafson who, um, so they're co-directing and Mark um, is a director that I've worked with a ton in commercials and he directed this commercial um, which I worked on with him, obviously. And um, he was also the animation supervisor on Fantastic Mr. Fox. Um, so, and then, you know, stop motion is just a really small world. So it's a lot of people. So um, like the art director on Pinocchio was actually my first boss in animation because he was the art director on um, Box Trolls. So, uh, sorry, he's production designer on Pinocchio. He was art director on Box Trolls and he was also the art director on Isle of Dogs, Wes's recent uh, film. So um, you run into a lot of the, the same people uh, a lot just by nature of um, teams that work well together, like you know pushing in and out of skills, knowing how you're gonna approach something, um, working with people um, you know, that you communicate well with. It, it just ends up making everybody's lives a little bit easier and, and um, just because it's such a specialized world, I think, <laughs> you just end up seeing the same people uh, over and over. But this was a, such a cool one because we wanted to keep it really lo-fi. We wanted it to be made of felt and we wanted to, because there's you know like 16 different sets in a really short amount of time and they have to transition into each other. You saw like, you know, the flowers come out and become this frame like in this image and the bridge, um, St. John's Bridge is the name of that bridge. It kind of pops open, like accordions open. Um, so there are all these transitions. And so there was a lot more in-depth work with storyboarding in the beginning. And there were a lot of sets that we tried and then kind of ended up pulling out because we found transitions that work better with other things. So we threw a lot at this one, but one of the cool things about it, and one of the cool things again um, about working in stop motion is that I think a lot of the charm comes in from the limitations that you have, meaning that like you only have so many materials and your stage is only so big. And if you're gonna do these transitions, they can't be wildly huge or they'd be too expensive, that kind of thing. And so you find a way to make the space work. So like for this one, you see me standing in this image. Um, uh, we did a little tour of some of this stuff. This is um, the, the image of the, um, Rose, the Rose Garden, the Rose Park. And the idea for all of these would be that they would have this painted um, deepest wall and they would be two and a half D back and then 3D closer to the camera, the characters made of felt and then, um, you know, paper and different other materials. And so um, you see it in the design for these things where it's planned to be fully painted and where the break is planned where things are built just with a little bit of depth, like a paper doll, and then into a third dimension. Um, so one of the things that while I'm into this stuff that I wanted to address is just that every time I tackle anything, uh, it always begins with reference. These are from real places, but even still it's animation and it's a stylized form of the world. And so you're, you're doing some interpretation and I, 
I widely view my job as um, being a curator, um, a, a synthesizer of different inputs that I kind of collect together. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but I just wanted to have addressed the idea of reference because it's such a huge part of my process. Um, I don't have a lot of things that I always do. I find that I do a lot of different kinds of design and because of that, my process is different for, you know, a character design for a CG show for really young kids as opposed to, you know, a stop motion show for adults or whatever thing. It, it's, it's a huge range, but reference, reference, reference is always the very first thing. These are a bunch of pictures of the farmer's market here in Portland. And one of the unique things about it is this town is in the middle of a forest essentially. And so it's just green and beautiful. But when you're going to these farmer's markets, you're also in the middle of these buildings. So it's like, you wanna combine both of those things, but give an overall sense of being in nature because that's the way this town feels. Um, so you see just the kind of like quick sketch up in the top and then um, a pass uh, in the bottom. And then we ended up changing to more, um, instead of just straight up vegetables, some, some like handmade products to mix into there as well but you kind of see how it, how it moved through the process. Um, same here, this is a local restaurant called Luck Lack. And um, you see the sketch and the references of the real place and then kind of the liberties that we took. Um, and again, the stage is really small. So you're building in that perspective, that forced perspective um, into the set and our main characters are pretty close to the camera. So we can kind of cheat those things. Um, so taking a step back and thinking about the broad scope of design, because I was trying to think of, you know, if, if um, you were coming to one of these things and you were going to a talk like this with me, um, the unique thing about me is that I do so many different kinds of things, so many different kinds of work. Um, and I was actually a fine art painter for a while. I came into animation late in life. I was an intern when I was 29. <laughs> that was my first uh, entry into the world of animation. Um, so I painted a lot of portraiture. I was really interested um, in realistic painting. I really wanted to learn. I grew up in the middle of the US where there isn't a lot of contact with um, the entertainment industry. And I didn't really know that that was a job. And these are some of the people I really um, loved that I really looked up to, um, you know, Velasquez, John Singer Sargent, Wayne Tebow, and um, Alice Neal. It's kind of a varied thing, but, you know, mostly oil painter people. Um, and as I got a little older and as I moved into animation, I started to really fall in love with Ivan Durrell and, um, you know, some people from kids' books like Miroslav Sasek and um, Christian Robinson there at the bottom. And then of course, Tadahiro on the bottom right, um, who I think is absolutely amazing. But looking at the huge range of those things even, um, what I start to realize about myself is one, I have an appreciation for a lot of different kinds of art. I don't have a feeling that one kind of art is better than another. Um, there are lots that aren't even represented here that I think are magnificent as well. I get really excited about all of it. Um, so style isn't that important to me. When I think about design, I don't think that much about style. Um, Brian McDonald, uh, a friend of mine who I've done some of these um, kind of conferences with, always says that style is how you choose to solve a problem. And I love that. I think it's brilliant because the way that Ivan Earl solves the problem of uh, a thorn forest it would be so very different than the way that John Singer Sargent would have solved that problem. And you, you see the difference and, and the reasoning behind it as well, because obviously in oil painting, we're gonna look at one image for a long time versus animation where you're gonna have glimpses of an image really quickly and you need to be able to say something with brevity and have it be clear and, and understood as these frames kind of move into each other. So the form, the function guides the form um, and the design is based on what you're trying to do with it. And to my mind, that informs the style as well. There are definitely people who work in one style and, and that's kind of their brand. That's not really me, um, but it is something that, that's valid as well. It's just not my point of view. Um, so to that end, moving into designing for animation, when I do these talks, usually, 
I'm there with the audience and we can have an interaction. Um, so it's a little bit weird because I, um, what I would ask is, why are the stormtroopers white? Um, and the answer, of course, is that Darth Vader's black. And that's it. It's really important that we pay attention to Darth Vader. Darth Vader is big and bad and he's like the pinnacle of every scene he's in. And one way to really, really, really make sure you get that is to make everything around him starkly in contrast so that he really, really stands out. Um, and I think that that is the, the number one thing to think about when we go to build these images. The number one thing for me is always like, what has to be conveyed? What is the practical information that has to happen? And then I get to play around with what's the emotional resonance, the emotional impact that I can reinforce with the choices that I make. But it always starts with the practical. Um, so Puss in Boots that I mentioned earlier, you know, the main character is a tiny orange tabby and he's really small and low to the ground. And we've got this town that he lives in and they've got all these murals and different things. And one of the things you're always thinking about is like, how can I keep the detail in the places to get the most bang for our buck? We don't want to put a bunch of detail in the middle of a building when he's either going to be bouncing around on rooftops or he's going to be running around on the street at the bottom. So, you know, cooler colors, colors that are going to pop the oranges and detail where it's going to pay off um, and thinking about his scale and all of that all becomes a big part of the design process. Um, it's kind of inseparable from the design process in that, um, it has to function for it to be uh, even start to think about being artful. Um, so Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, this is another one that I love to point out because um, this is another one where they found a way to use the design to, to functionally tell us where we are in the story. We don't have to have little blurbs popping up all the time to tell us when we are. Um, he's moving through all these memories and because her hair color is different in these different periods of time, we start to pick up on where he is in the timeline of their relationship just based on that color, um, which I think is just such an elegant way to deal with all these time jumps. Um, the Matrix, again, is another one where they use these color tone filters to really show you um, where you are because otherwise if you're might be a little confused when you're in the matrix you get this kind of green tone to everything and then when they're in the real world they're in this bluer kind of starker uh more gritty color field so um the next thing i want to talk about is contrast and we're starting to move into what design is for and i think before we think about what design is for, we have to think about the fact that in order for anyone to care what it's for, um, they have to want to engage with it, right? And we talk a lot about appeal when we talk about animation. And I think appeal is important. Appeal is, um, is absolutely important, but to me, it's not quite the right word because there are things that are absolutely unappealing that are still captivating. So, I always think about it being the word dynamic. I think that when you're trying to design something, you're trying to communicate something. Visual design is communication. And in order to communicate with someone, you have to get them to stop and engage. Um, so you need to create something that is first and foremost dynamic. And when you think about what makes a person look, um, what makes a person give the attention that they have to give. And if you think about it from just a human standpoint of, you know, you're in the jungle and something moves um, or something is red in the middle of all the green, you know, um, what we notice are differences. We're very trained to notice the, the differences and for the extreme differences to be very jarring and even alarming to us. Um, and that being said, there's also value to um, playing in that range of contrasts, right? Um, to create totally different emotions. So I want to introduce this idea of contrast and I want to address the fact that contrast is absolutely something that we um, think about as a value problem. We think of contrast as dark to light, right? We've got this image from Pan's Labyrinth and the dark to light is what makes it so beautiful. It sets such a lovely mood. It's um, a bit low key um, and the information is, is so delicate, right? It could fall apart, um, but your eye makes out what it is. 
Um, but it, it sets a very kind of murky, deep, dark, scary kind of tone. We don't know what all's happening around there and that's very uncomfortable for us. Um, but that's just one kind of contrast, right? Like value is just one element. So while that's super important, and again, like here we have the value range, right? And again, just briefly talking about like what each setup does. And these are just a few different value setups, but you know, on the left, we have these two high key images from aliens and our alien and moonlight. Um, and those have like a very spiritual, very um, ethereal kind of vibe. They feel fairly positive. Uh, they feel heavenly, right? Um, and then you go to the middle and both of these images are from um, Spike Jones's Her, um, which I love, I love that movie. Um, one of the things that's great about it is he's so separated from the world. He's so withdrawn and his world is so contained to himself. And they keep the value range just in the middle, like very compressed in the middle. And one of the things that does is on the top, it gives you this kind of contented, lovely haze. But on the bottom image, it gives you this boredom, this kind of like sad depression that he lives his life in. And that's all information I feel like you get even just from the value without anything else. And I love that. Um, and then on the far right, you've got more of a high contrast situation where you're kind of obliterating the middle values and getting the high and the low end of the spectrum. And we see that in our horror movies, our action movies. Um, that is Aliens at the top and then Sin City at the bottom. And there's definitely other iterations of this. There's, um, you know, totally low key, that kind of thing. And they have their own sort of moods to them. But I just wanted to address this idea of value contrast before I move toward other types of contrast. So Edward Scissorhands is, is a classic, of course, but one of the things that I really love about this movie, um, and every time I go back to watch it, I notice it again and again, is that they play with some of the other kinds of contrast in really funny, kind of clever ways. They sort of flip them over. Um, so color to absence of color, that's a contrast, right? That's a difference, and it creates a, a point to look at. And one of the things that you always notice in these scenes with Edward, or even as Edward stand in his house at the top of this hill, is this big, dark, desaturated area in the middle of this like Easter egg sort of pastel wonderland, right? It's like there's this cake with all these decorations, and then there's this dead thing in the middle of it. Um, and it's very tongue in cheek because these colors that are kind of associated with Easter and happiness and, you know, bright bright afternoons um, become really sinister and they become too much. It's like eating a cake with too much icing on it. It's just very um, overwrought. And I love how he does that. He kind of flips that around. Um, but again, that contrast makes for really good visuals. It, it makes it very dynamic. It tells me exactly what's important. And I know that there must be something important about him because he stands out so much in that separation. Um, Paddington is divine. I absolutely love it. Um, but this is another one where they use a contrast that is not about value. It's about warm to cool. Uh, in this case, it's so it's a primary color setup because those creams are kind of in a yellow field and then you've got your red. But the only cool color in there is this blue, this kind of teal and blue. And in the first image of Sally Hawkins on the bed, her stripe in the sweater and then there's a little bit on the frame and a little bit on the glowy candle on the left side. And then even when we pull out in this scene and we get this frame doorway, um, we get this blue glow behind him showing us exactly where we need to look. Um, so even in, I mean, that room is pretty chaotic. There's a ton of pattern, there's a ton going on, but because all that chaos is going on in this red color field, and then we get this pop of blue that just lets us know where things are happening, right? So it just brings clarity in so that you can get the information that you need. In, this, in addition to just being aesthetically very interesting, um, it also just helps communicate a little more quickly, it helps the viewer know where to latch in. Um, one of my favorite things, one of my favorite kinds of contrast is noise to quiet. Um, so here you get like, 
and this is just a black and white um, study that I did of Drive a long time ago, but it's such a great scene because this character is, um, he is very quiet. He literally barely speaks and he's such a mystery and everything's kind of jittering around him. So this scene when and they're in the convenience store, all of this chaos and, and visual noise all around him to this like quiet, flat black um, jacket and, and color in there is, is so lovely. And, and it gives like a really calm sense for him. You feel that about him. Um, and this is the same idea as of contrast as like noise, 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 quieter space. Um, sorry for the gore a little bit there. These are all from Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Um, and I love this movie because it, it does, throws the same things at you over and over, but in really different ways. Um, and it absolutely does a ton of like jitter, 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 quiet space. It, but the tone of it is so different in this. In this, it feels like a fly caught in a trap, uh, especially that bottom right one with that mirror table that reflects this netting all the way around him. It's like he is stuck in there and he can't get out. Same with the others, but they're dead bodies. So you feel like that's a little on the nose. Um, there are other scenes in this movie where it's like they're walking through a library and you can see through all the windows and there's all these trees and all these things, but then the bodies are just these dark shapes moving through. It's uh, really beautifully done, but that's another form of contrast, right? Pattern, visual noise to emptier space, deader space. And it can go the other way where you've got more dead space and then a really concentrated burst of pattern or texture. Um, this is an image from Bioshock. It's a concept piece of concept art from Bioshock actually, which is a game, um, which is really, it's a very beautiful game, but I really like this image because I like, you know, you've got a lot of different kinds of contrasts happening, surprising kinds of contrasts, right? It's like, you've got warm to cool, of course. And you've also got this gridded pattern to these more organic kind of in and out shapes. Um, you've got scale contrast, this huge globe to the smaller people, or even the huge buildings outside to the smaller people inside. Um, amount of detail, you know. Um, one of the really successful ways to use contrast when you do this, one of the things that happens in my mind, and I, it happens if I'm not really careful, you don't have to use every kind of contrast all the time, right? It's about picking one or two and really using them um, in a very kind of pointed way. And I think one of the ways to really dial that up is to use a huge percentage of one and a smaller of another. Like you want contrast of the contrast, right? You don't wanna have like half of the image is pattern, half of the image is empty, half of the image, you know, we've got a character this big and a character this big right next to each other very evenly unless you're trying to create something that is a lot more stable and a lot less um, poppy feeling, right? So you start to look at these things in, um, in films and in photography and, and everywhere you're looking, you start to notice these contrasts and how they're making an impact and how they're making you feel. To me, it's like they all feed each other, right? I start to look for contrast. I start to look when I have a feeling and try to break that down of like how those things are playing out. Um, I've got a couple images here from a book by Molly Bang called Picture This. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this book, but there's a free PDF of it online and I recommend it. It's very, it's very simple. All of these ideas are very simple, but for me, it's, it's so much to keep in mind all the time. And it's, the kind of things that you kind of have to always be reminding yourself to think about. Um, but she goes through Little Red Riding Hood and she just talks about making choices to um, sort of establish in really simple shapes um, with really simple few colors, how to establish the relationships and the story of Little Red Riding Hood. So. The frame before this was probably just two sim same sized triangles, but it's supposed to be red and her mom, right? And so we established red and she's a small triangle. And then we threw another triangle in there and it was like, okay, well, you can't figure out which, mom, which one's mom and which one's red. 
So then you blow up one of the triangles and it's like, okay, that reads as mom and red, but we still need to feel like red is more special and we need to feel something different about mom than we feel about red. Um, so, okay, so if we round mom off, if we soften her, then she feels more motherly, she feels more nurturing, she feels literally softer, um, creates a little more of a contrast. But if we go even further and we give her a separate color, maybe a color that's less dominant, um, main colors, main characters are often blue or red, uh, yellow or green, these strong, closer to primary sorts of colors, the kind of colors that really stand out in a lot of environments. Um, the violet reads as a secondary character's color on its own. So then red goes off into the forest. Oh, I think these are, these are not in order. Um, red goes off into the forest and it, so the scale of it makes the forest scary, right? The fact that the trees go off the frame, the fact that she's so small and these huge trunks, that's already somewhat upsetting. Um, but then if you just put them on a diagonal, suddenly it's, it's, it feels like it's moving. It's very tense. The pressure that it puts, even in a static image, um, creates a tension and a stress to the viewer that makes it feel like something a lot more nefarious is happening. We had mystery before and now we have actual danger. And that's another thing too of like where you're putting a character in a frame how you're creating um, pressure on them by the placement of other things. If there's a large character and a small character, is the small character sort of caught between the large character and the edge of frame, things like that. So I love to show this image. Um, I, I teach classes online sometimes. And, and one of the things that we were doing with the students um, the last time I taught a class is we would do color scripts with them. And one of the things I always loved is um, often I would have students tell me, well, you know, I have this lady and, and she's blonde haired and she's got a red jacket or whatever those colors are. And, and they would say, well, I'm kind of locked into that. I don't feel like there's much of anywhere to go. And we've been talking this whole time about references and about the information that needs to be conveyed and about generating contrast to create clarity. But one thing we haven't talked as much about that's equally as important um, and something that is gonna make your art yours is choices. Um, so much of this, like I said, it, to me it's curation. And what that means is that each curator given the same pile of information, the same pile of input might have a really different export of what they come up with to solve that problem. Um, this is obviously um, Hellboy, you're probably familiar uh, from the really popular comic series um, by Mike Mignola. And I love to show this because Hellboy is this huge fire engine red colored character. And so as somebody doing a color script, you would think, okay, if I've got Hellboy, I'm kind of locked in, right? Like he's always this fire engine red and there's not this variability. And, um, Dave Stewart does the color for Hellboy. I think he did the color for all of the ones that I have on screen here. Um, and there's no real cheating in comics, especially the way that he does these. There's no gradients, there's no blending. It's all about light interaction and making choices. And so what I love about this is you get to see this character of Hellboy through all these different iterations and how he's making all these choices for the character and he's also letting the context of the situation and the tone of the space that he's in really, really dramatically influence this character's color. Um, so I think the lesson in it to me is, you know, you make your choices, but then you, you break those and you bend those as far as you want, as far as you need to, to create different feelings, to generate, um, to reinforce different emotions as someone's interacting with the thing that you made. Um, so I think that's, this is just such an effective um, way that he's done that. And each one has such a different vibe. You are purple, purple action Hellboy at the bottom has a very different tone than, you know, the kind of somber, sadder, um, off-white, like beigey one on the bottom right. 
So I wanted to show you guys another thing and, and talk a little bit about it. It's one of the things that I can that I can kind of show you. Um, and it's exciting because we got to go through a whole process and this is another stop motion project. Um, so I don't know if you guys are familiar with Monkey Paw Productions. Um, that's Jordan Peele's production company who was responsible for Get Out. He wrote and directed Get Out and um, Us. And then um, done a bunch of other things more recently. His production company does Lovecraft Country and all those things. And we were doing their animated logo. And it was with the same director that I worked on Shivering Truth with, uh, Kat Solon. And it was here at Shadow Machine. and. We weren't sure what it was. Uh, we just knew it was going to be kind of a shorter thing, it was like a 15 second thing, and it was going to be we could do we could do like one set. It could be kind of elaborate, but there were a lot of limitations as far as time and how much we were able to build. So this one really started without a board or anything, and we were trying to figure out, okay, you know, the idea of an animated logo. It's kind of like when you watch a Disney movie and you've got the castle and then the arc comes across the sky and maybe you get to come up the river or whatever thing, but it, it's very short and just kind of gives you the tone of a production house or studio. And um, obviously for for Jordan's companies, it's very much about, there's, there's kind of a magical element, there's a social justice element, there's um, a supernatural sort of element. Um, it's very mysterious and has its own tone um, that we were trying to kind of capture. And I was looking at a lot of um, older horror, classic horror, um, The Shining, of course, um, Jordan really loves, but also, you know, um, oh gosh, my brain is leaving me. Sorry, The Stepford Wives, yes. And then um, things like, even just things like Gremlins, uh, that have this tone, there is this mysterious quality and some of them are a little more comedic, but we went through all these options of what this could be. And the idea was we've got the monkey paw, which is the name of their company, but also there's the tale of the monkey paw that you make this wish and you know, be careful what you wish for because a lot of times when you make a wish on a monkey paw, it kind of goes wrong. And then of course there are all these connotations to monkey paws that have to do um, with the black community and, and, and with racism in general. Um, so it kind of fits in with his company and fits in with these tones, but, and then the teacup from Get Out. And so this monkey paw is stirring the teacup and we're approaching it really slowly from behind. And so you don't see that it's not attached to anything. And that's kind of the, the basic premise that we knew we had. We just didn't know what the setting was and what the approach looks like. So I did all these options and this was kind of like a, really spooky room with all these different items. You can imagine like there's occult things going on or um, something untoward. Same thing with this, it was like, we're in this hotel room and someone's laid up here doing something. We're not totally sure what it is, but the plant's dead in the corner. So we don't feel super good about it. Um, but generally setting this tone and like how we're gonna approach this monkey paw. Um, same thing with the train. The train was a was an early on idea and we were just trying to figure out how to make it work, like how we could manage to build it on the timeline that we had um, and make that work. And it, it took a lot of drawings. You're gonna see two drawings. Um, this is the one we ended up with, but I think it could have it could have gone either way. But the idea was that we don't know what's happened on this train. There don't seem to be any passengers. There's all these items that seem to tell different stories. We're not gonna get to know what those stories are, but they have a sort of air of mystery. And then we kind of approach the last, the last entity standing on this train, which is of course the monkey paw itself. So this is the painting that we finished out and um, you know, we're referencing vertigo and um, really trying to use a lot of um, over the top color, you know, it's, um, it's a really short, brief pop to say, hey, we're here and this is what we stand for. So you wanna try and make it exciting. You wanna try and give it a vibe and a tone. And I'll show you guys how the actual logo came out.
it was so lovely to do that one. It was cool to watch um, our. So thank you guys so much. Um, it's been really fun to walk through some of that stuff with you guys. Um, putting it together was actually kind of interesting. So I was trying to solidify some ideas. So it actually kind of refined things for me as far as uh, how I'm trying to think about this stuff and um, how I go about doing my job with each different project. Um, I hope it, it sort of gave you some things to think about. I know some of it's a, a bit basic, um, but I think some of the best lessons in what we do uh, are pretty basic and we have to kind of keep reminding ourselves that, that the simpler um, things are, are what communicate the best. And I, I hope that comes across. Um, yeah, so I look forward to answering questions. I'm so excited to um, hopefully get to talk to some of you guys and I'll see you again soon. Thanks so much.